This is the day when life is raw, quivering, terrifying. The day of numbed emotions, the day of blunt nails and splintered wood, of bruised flesh and red blood. The day we loathe when hopes are crushed. The day we long for, when pretenses fall away, because the worst that we can do cannot kill the love of God. Gracious God, honorable. We would stand with Christ in the midst of the horrors of this world, where betrayal and death constantly threaten your love and peace. God, we need a faith that is able to face the suffering and terrifying brutality of our world. We need a faith that is unafraid of the brother or sister whose skin is a different colour, who speaks with a different accent or dances to a different song. We need a faith that is able to face the horror of hunger in a world that has enough for everyone. We need a faith that won't avoid the reality of death squads and the chilling terror of torture. We need a faith that won't avoid the hardened greed that sells millions of children into slavery of prostitution. We need a faith that can face the fact that you can be killed by those who judge you a threat to their order and welfare and piety. We need a faith that refuses the way of cynicism and the despair of resignation and sees love and good in the world. We need a faith that is red with hope, that leads to change and welcomes freedom. God, take us again to the cross. Amen.
Christ our victim, whose beauty was disfigured and whose body torn upon the cross. Open wide your arms to embrace our tortured world, that we may not turn away our eyes, but abandon ourselves to your mercy. Amen. After the supper and after Jesus had prayed for his followers, they went outside and headed across town to the Kidron Valley Gardens, where they had often met before. Jesus, Judas had now betrayed G Jesus, and of course he knew they would be heading for the gardens. Judas showed the way to those sent to arrest Jesus. A detachment of Roman soldiers and some temple security guards sent by the chief priests and the hardline Pharisee party. It was now late, and so the heavily armed group carried torches and floodlights. Jesus knew what he had coming to him, and so when they arrived, he just stepped out of, into the open and asked, Who are you looking for? They answered, We've been sent to find Jesus of Nazareth. Well, you found him, he replied. I'm Jesus. When he said that, they were taken aback. You could have knocked them over with a feather. Judas, the backstabber, was still with them. Because they were looking so uncertain, Jesus asked them again, Who are you looking for? And again they replied, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, like I said, I'm Jesus. And since I am the man you are looking for, you can let these others go in peace. In so saying, he backed up the promise he had made in his earlier prayer when he had said, I didn't lose a single one of those you entrusted to me. Suddenly, Simon Peter pulled a knife and began slashing wildly. He struck a man named Malchus, a servant of the high priest, and cut off his ear. Jesus yelled at him, saying, Peter, put that thing away. Don't you think I'm going, do you think I'm going to back out now and refuse to drink the cup that God has poured for me? At that point, the soldiers and the temple security guards surrounded Jesus and made the arrest. Again and again we have bound you and taken you captive, O Lord. Because it's easier, easier than facing the reality of what you ask of us. Again and again you have been taken captive and your voice silenced. Again and again you have been dragged out whenever it seems that quoting your name will justify our attempts to gain what we want at the expense of others. They handcuffed him and dragged him off to see Annas, who had issued the arrest warrant. Annas was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year. And Caiaphas was the one who had persuaded the authorities that, for the sake of the rest of the population, it would be best if this one person died. Simon Peter and one of the other disciples followed as Jesus was dragged off. When they arrived at the high priest's residence, Peter was refused entry at the gate, but the other disciple knew the high priest and got in. Having got in, he spoke to the woman in charge of the security gate and had Peter let in too. As he came in, the woman looked at Peter and said, you're not one of that man's disciples, are you? He replied, no, I'm not. The soldiers and guards were standing around an open fire in the middle of the courtyard warming themselves because it was a cold night. Not knowing what else to do, Peter joined them. Inside, the high priest was interrogating Jesus about his followers and about the things he had been teaching the people. Jesus answered him saying, everything I've said has been out in the open. I have always done my teaching in the public places where the people gather, in the synagogues and in the temple. I've kept nothing behind closed doors. So what are you asking me for? Why don't you ask the people who heard what I said? 
they can tell you what it was all about. When he said this, one of the security guards gave Jesus a whack in the face saying, you think you can get away with back chatting the high priest, do you? But Jesus stood his ground saying, if you think there's something wrong with what I've been saying, then put your evidence on the table. But if what I'm saying is correct, what are you smacking me around for? While this was happening, Simon Peter was still keeping warm by the fire with the guards. They asked him, aren't you one of his disciples? Not me, said Peter, denying everything. One of the temple guards there was a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off when he'd pulled the knife in the garden. He said, come on, mate, you've got to be one of them. Didn't I just see you with him in the garden when we picked him up? But Peter denied it again, and the words were barely out of his mouth when he heard the sound of the rooster crowing. Shortly after that, in the early hours of the morning, Jesus was transferred from the residence of Caiaphas to the headquarters of Pilate, the Roman governor. The Jewish officers themselves did not go inside the headquarters because it was nearly time for the sacred Passover festival and going into a Gentile home would have ruled them out of participating. Pilate agreed to come out and meet their delegation and asked them, so what have you charged this bloke with? They answered, you can take it for granted that he's a dangerous criminal. Otherwise, we wouldn't have bothered you with this case. Pilate replied, I'm sure you're quite capable of dealing with him yourselves. Get him out of here and deal with him according to your own local laws. But the Jewish officers said, we don't have the power to authorize an execution. Clearly, the things Jesus had previously said about the sort of death he would die were coming true. Pilate went back into his headquarters and had Jesus brought inside so he could interrogate him. Do you see yourself as the king of the Jews? He asked. Jesus replied, saying, Is that your own question? Or has someone else been wording you up? Give me a break, Pilate retorted. I'm obviously not one of the Jews, am I? It wasn't my people who had you dragged in here. It was your mob, your own race, your own religious leaders. What in the world have you done? Jesus answered, my reign is not tied to this world. If my power base depended on this world, those who have given their allegiance to me would be fighting tooth and nail to keep me out of the hands of that mob. But it's not like that. My reign is not tied to this world. Pilate latched onto that. So you are claiming to be a king then? You're the one who's putting the king label on me, Jesus replied. If you want to know what I'm on about, what I was born into the world for, it's this. I'm the key witness whose job it is to speak the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. Everyone who has given their allegiance to the truth responds to my voice. Truth, Pilate sneered. What is truth?
Then he went back outside to the delegation from the temple and told them, I can't find any basis for a case against this prisoner. It is customary for me to release a political prisoner for you at Passover time. How about I release this King of the Jews for you? He seems harmless enough to me. But they shouted back, no way, not this man. Release Barabbas. Barabbas was a convicted terrorist. At that point, Pilate handed Jesus over to some of his own soldiers and told them to give him a flogging. The soldiers thought it was a huge joke. They hung a purple robe on him and wove a crown out of barbed wire and jammed it on his head. They took turns at coming up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, as they saluted him and then smashed their fists into his face. When they'd finished their brutal sport, Pilate went back out to the temple delegation and said, look, I'm handing him back over to you and telling you that I can't find any basis for a case against him. Jesus was dragged back out, still wearing the barbed wire crown and the purple robe. Pilate said, here he is, the man. But the minute the chief priests and temple security guards saw him, they began screaming, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate replied, you take him and crucify him yourselves. I can't see that he's done anything wrong. The delegation replied, the case against him is clear in our law. He claimed to be the son of God and our law makes the death penalty mandatory for that. When Pilate heard this, he began to really worry and went back inside his headquarters to interview Jesus again. Where have you come from? He asked him. But Jesus didn't answer. Pilate said to him, it's no use claiming the right to silence. Don't you understand that I can say the word to have you released or have you tortured to death? Jesus replied, you wouldn't have any authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from a higher power. It is the one who handed me over to you who is going to have to answer for the greatest wrongdoing. After that, Pilate tried to have Jesus released, but the temple crowd would have none of it. They insisted, if you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor, and we'll see that he hears about it. Anyone who claims to be a king is setting himself up in opposition to the emperor. With that, Pilate capitulated to their demands. At noon on the day of preparation for the Passover festival, Pilate sat down at the judge's bench at the stone pavement court, known in Hebrew as Gabbatha, and, and had Jesus stood in the dock. He said to the temple delegation, here is your king, they shouted in chorus, get rid of him, kill him, crucify him. Crucify him, Pilate replied. You want me to crucify your king? We have no king but the emperor, they shouted. With that, Pilate passed sentence and handed Jesus over to them to be crucified.
Behold, the wood of the cross on which the Saviour of the world was hung. Come, let us worship him. Behold, the wood of the cross on which the Saviour of the world was hung. Come, let us worship him. Behold, the wood of the cross which the Saviour of the world was hung. Come, let us worship him. So they took Jesus out to the place called Skull Hill, or in Hebrew, Golgotha. Jesus was made to carry his own cross on the way out there. When they got there, they hung him on the cross by nails driven through his flesh. They crucified a couple of other convicted men at the same time, the three of them in a row with Jesus in the middle. On Pilate's orders, a sign was hung on the cross Jesus was on, saying, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many people read the sign because the crucifixion occurred in a public place on the main road into the city. And the sign was written in three languages, Hebrew, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests from the temple went to Pilate, objecting to the sign. They wanted the sign changed from the king of the Jews to this man claimed to be the king of the Jews. But Pilate told them that what was written was written and that was the end of the story. When the soldiers had hung Jesus up on the nails, they divided up his clothes between the four of them. His robe was left over and when they saw that it was woven from a single piece of fabric with no seams, they decided that rather than tear it, they'd have a round of two up and award it to the winner. This backed up what the scriptures had said long ago. They divided up my clothes and tossed for my coat. Saviour of the world, what have you done to deserve this? And what have we done to deserve you? Strung up between criminals, cursed and spat upon, you wait for death and look for us, for us whose sin has crucified you. To the mystery of undeserved suffering, you bring the deeper mystery of unmerited love. Forgive us for, for not knowing, knowing what we have done. Open our eyes to what we are doing now. As so would and nails, you disempower our depravity and transform us by your grace. Scripture reading comes from Isaiah chapter 52. The Lord says, This one who serves on my behalf will succeed. He will come out on top and be honoured by everyone. Many people were shocked by what had happened to him. His appearance was enough to make them throw up. Torture had disfigured him beyond recognition. At first sight, he no longer looked human. The next time he's seen will be an even greater shock. Nations and their kings will fall to their knees, speechless. All of a sudden, what they have never seen or understood will be as plain as day and all they can think about. The people reply to this news saying, who could have believed what we now know to be true? Who would have recognised what the Lord was doing? This one who serves on the Lord's behalf grew up hard like a plant, taking root in the stony desert. To look at him, you wouldn't think he'd amount to much. Nothing about his appearance would make you look twice. Others wrote him off and treated him as scum. Pain and suffering were his constant companions. He was despised and abused, but we looked away. We didn't consider him worth caring about. The sickness and brokenness he endured turned out to be ours. If it wasn't for him, it would have wiped us out. But back then we thought it was his own fault and that God was punishing him for what he had done. In reality, it was what we had done that was to blame. It was us who deserved to be punished. But him who copped the flack. When he was left battered, broken and bleeding, we were off the hook free to enjoy the fruits of health and wholeness. We were all doing our own thing in our own way, 
as far off track as a penguin in the desert, as far off key as a mob of galahs. And yet the Lord held him to account for the actions of each and every one of us. He was ripped off and kicked around, but he took it on the chin. Not once did he ever whinge or protest. He was as silent as the lamb that trots to its fate, knowing neither shearer nor slaughterer. His arrest and trial made a mockery of justice. No one knew or cared what he was up against. He was dragged off in the midst of life, put to death for crimes committed by our people. Although he had never breathed a lie or done anything to hurt anyone, they buried him alongside the callous and corrupt, thoughtless profiteers who died rich. The Lord says, it was me who decided to allow this tragedy to befall the one who serves on my behalf. He made the ultimate sacrifice at your hands and won forgiveness for you in the process. So now he will be rewarded with life. He will live to see his children and their children through his actions. My plan was able to succeed. In the depths of agony and despair, he discovered the truth. And with the truth, he found peace. The one who serves on my behalf was beyond reproach, but he took responsibility for what others did and left their record as spotless as his own. Because of all he has done, I, the Lord, elevate him to the hall of fame and give him the rewards of true greatness. He deserves the best, for he made the ultimate sacrifice, accepting the death of a common criminal, so that through his suffering and prayers, others might be cut free from their sin. God my God, why have you turned your back on me? How come in my most desperate hour you are nowhere to be found? I call you all day, God, over and over. I tossed and I turned all night, but I still didn't hear back from you. Jesus Aren't you the one we've always voted for? Our ancestors put their trust in you and you never let them down. They cried out for help and you stepped in. You saved them from disaster and shame. So what about me? Shouldn't I still be treated as a human being, even if I feel like a worm, looked down on, loathed, stomped on? Everyone who sees me sticks the boots in. They turn up their noses and dismiss me with a smearing joke. Why don't you see if God's on your side? Surely, if you're a mate of God's, then God will help you out. Jesus. What's the story, God? Your hands eased me from my mother's womb. You kept me from harm as I suckled at her breast. As a baby, I rested trustingly in your arms. You've been my God since the day 
I was. about to break loose and there is no one else I can turn to. I'm surrounded by enemies like a mob of wild bulls, angry, snorting, stampeding beasts. They charge at me, all horns and pounding hooves. like a bucket of dirty water and I'm so smashed up I can barely move it all. heart has gone to jelly a quivering usually blob my throat is as dry as a salt pan and my tongue sticks to the roof of my mouth and you you have left me for dead over the dust and flies like a pack of hang hungry dingoes they sniff around me evil mongols, every one of them. I'm so wasted, my hands and feet feel like they could snap off. My ribs stick out like a picket fence. They hang me up for public viewing, boasting over how they finish me off. They empty my pockets and toss a coin to see who gets my clothes. What are you doing, Lord? Don't quit on me now. Get your heart together and come to my rescue. Save me before I get my throat cut, before my body's dog meat. Pull me out before I get their teeth into me. people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I brooded over the abyss, and with my words I called forth creation. But you have brooded on destruction and manufactured the means of chaos. Holy people what have i done to you how have i offended you answer me i breathed life into your bodies and carried you tenderly in my arms but you have armed yourselves for war 
breathing out threats of violence. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I made the desert blossom before you. I fed you with an open hand, but you have grasped the children's food and laid waste to fertile lands. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. my people what have i done to you how have i offended you answer me i abandoned my power like a garment choosing your unprotected flesh but you have robed yourselves in privilege and chosen to despise the abandoned Holy God. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I would have gathered you to me as a lover and shown you the ways of peace, but you have desired security and you would not surrender yourself. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. O oh my people, what have I done to you? How have I, how have I offended you? Answer me. I have torn the veil of my glory, transfiguring the earth, but you have disfigured my beauty and turned away your face. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I have laboured to deliver you as a woman delights to give life, but you have delighted in bloodshed and laboured to bereave the world. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, O oh my people, what have I done to you? How have I offended you? Answer me. I have followed you with the power of my spirit to seek truth and heal the oppressed. But you have been following a lie and returned to your own comfort. Holy God, holy and mighty, holy and immortal one, have mercy upon us.
O oh Christ, we are stripped bare by your suffering. You see our dreams and our demons and the secrets we keep even from ourselves. Forgive all that needs to be forgiven. Heal all that needs to be healed. Awaken all the good that sleeps in us. Banish all the fears that paralyze us. Put the power of your cross into our lives forever and clothe us with hope and love. Amen. The Holy Spirit says to us in the scriptures, the new alliance I will make with the people will be different, says the Lord. No more writing down the rules for people to read. This time I'll write them into their hearts and minds. I'll wipe the record of their failings and their perverse behavior. None of it will ever again even enter my mind. So if that's done, if the slate has been wiped clean, then there's no longer any need to come offering sacrifices to try to make up for what we've done wrong. So, my friends, now it's a whole new ball game. Now we can confidently walk straight into the sacred place because Jesus won us that right, spilling his own blood in the process. We walk in via a new route. The old way had a big curtain between us and the sacred place. On the new route, the only thing between us and the sacred place is Jesus, and he invites us to become part of his own body and go in that way. Add all that to the fact that Jesus himself is now our great priest, who says what goes in the house of God, and you will understand what is now open to us. So let's go. Let's approach God with integrity and with deep trust. Let us stand before God, knowing for sure that not only have our bodies been washed clean in pure water, but so too have our hearts, our minds, and our conscience. While the soldiers tossed coins, a group of women stood near Jesus' cross. They were his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary of Magdala. Jesus saw that his mother was standing with the disciple with whom he was most intimate. And so he said to his mother, woman, this man is your son. And then he said to the disciple, this woman is your mother. From that day on, Mary moved into the home of that disciple. After that, Jesus knew it was all over. He did one more thing that the scriptures had spoken about. He said, I'm thirsty. Someone had half a bottle of wine that had turned to vinegar. So they poured some into a sponge and held it up to his mouth. He drank it and then said, everything is finished. With that, his head dropped and he gave up his spirit.
Because it was the day of preparation for the Passover, the temple authorities wanted to make sure the bodies were not left hanging up on the sacred festival day. They went to Pilate and got him to authorize the shoulders, that the soldiers, to break the legs of the three crucified men so that they would die quickly. The soldiers broke the legs of the other two crucified men, but when they came to Jesus, they saw that there was no need. He was already dead. Just to make sure, one of the soldiers drove a spear into his side and blood and water gushed out. The eyewitness to these things has given a sworn account of it all. This report is true and can be trusted. Scripture was again shown to be true because it was written that not one of his bones would be broken. Similarly, in another place, the scriptures said, they will look on the one they have pierced. Once again, we don't want to face up to what we have done. We, we quickly, quickly seek to clean up the mess, mess to hide the evidence, to get life normal again. We want it finished and the body put out of sight. And yet, yet that broken, broken body, if we would only really face it, is the evidence of the love we crave and the, and the source, source of the healing we cry for. Give us courage to see beyond the blood and the horror. Give, Give us the hope that in this death we may find our own life. When it was all over, a man went to Pilate and got permission to take the body of Jesus for burial. His name was Joseph of Arimathea, and he had been a closet follower of Jesus because he was afraid for his reputation with the temple hierarchy. He and Nicodemus, who had first spoken to Jesus in the quiet of night, removed the body. Nicodemus supplied the embalming spices and as was the Jewish custom, they wrapped the body with the spices in linen cloth. There was a memorial garden not far from the place where Jesus was crucified, and there was a tomb there which had not yet been used. Because it was the day of preparation and there was little time, they buried Jesus in that tomb. Jesus See to it that we stand firm in the faith we've already put our hands up to. After all, the one who will present us to God and speak on our behalf, our great high priest, 
is Jesus. And as God's own son, we can be sure he has God's ear. We can also be sure that he can relate to the realities we have to live with because he has already been through everything we have to go through. Weakness, doubts and torments and all without selling out to sin. What more could we want in a high priest? So let's not be timid. Whenever we're in need of help, let's walk right up to the throne of God and ask. For our God is extravagantly welcoming and generous, only too happy to wipe out our debts and help us out. When Jesus was among us and the threat of death was closing in on him, it was with agonised cries and tears that he did his priestly work of offering up prayers and appeals to the God who has the power to save us from death. His pleas were heard because of his prayerful acceptance of God's will. He was given no special privileges as a son. He got his lessons in obedience in the same school of suffering as the rest of us. Once he had made the grade, perfecting all that he had to learn, he became the one who sets free all who trust and follow him. For them, he is the source of life without limit. Let us unite ourselves in the ministry of intercession with our High Priest, Jesus Christ, who, even in the face of death, continued to offer our prayers and appeals for the world he loved. It was priests of the holy faith and civic authorities of the holy city who conspired to get rid of Jesus. So let us pray for the leaders of church and state that they might seek justice and truth and advance the peace and welfare of all. Your will be done, Lord. Your love be shown. As the darkness closed in on Jesus, in agony of heart he prayed, Father, take this cup from me. So let us pray for all who live in fear and cry out for deliverance. Your will be done, Lord. Your love be shown. It was with a kiss that Jesus was betrayed, the sign of heaven used for hell. So let us pray for all who have been betrayed and for those who are crippled by the misery of having betrayed another.
Your will be done, Lord. Your love be shown. It was ordinary people like us whose cries of Hosanna turned to crucify. So let us pray for the ordinary people of places where lusts for vengeance and domination crowd out the holy passion for peace. And let us especially pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Your will be done, Lord. Your love be shown. Jesus was condemned on false charges, dragged outside the city, bruised and battered, and tortured to death before a jeering crowd. So let us pray for all who unjustly bear the wounds of a broken world, that their suffering too might not be in vain. Your will be done, Lord. Your love be shown. Jesus sought forgiveness for those who drove nails into his flesh, even before they knew their wrongdoing. So let us pray for ourselves that we might have the strength to forgive where wrong is done to us, but our strength in forgiving, but that our strength in forgiving, not weaken our resisting of evil. Your will be done, Lord. Your love be shown. Forsaken and alone on the cross, it was into the hands of God that Jesus entrusted his spirit. As he had come into the world with nothing, so now he departed. So let us pray for all who face impending death and for all who have departed.
your will be done, Lord. Your love be shown. Finally, let us pray for all those things for which our Lord taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. On earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. As we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial. Save us from the time of trial. And deliver us from evil. For the kingdom of power. That which is Christ-like within us shall be crucified. It shall suffer and be broken. And that which is Christ-like within us shall rise up. It shall love and create. Lord Christ, your bitter agony was watched from afar by frightened followers. Give us courage and love, so that being steadfast in the face of horror, we may also know the place of resurrection in your name. Amen. Amen.